Hario, greetings from Niagara Falls. And happy to see all of you. So many of you are so passionate about how Prithvi, it brings more inspiration to me. Earlier today, I was trying to define, in terms of a vision and lifestyle, qualities that make one a strong seeker. And two of the qualities that I explained, the first was Dhamma. That's the Sanskrit word, D-A-M-A, -A, which means to not react. When provoked, when shaken, when imbalanced, to not react. How many of you would describe yourself as someone who doesn't react by show of hands? Okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're here for your welfare and my welfare too. <laughs> so, so Dhamma is not to react. And then I also explained Shama, S-H-A-M-A, -A, which means to tune one's mind to the circumstance. To tune one's mind to the circumstance. Got it? Not reacting. Yes to tuning. Our Prithvi Seva Sangha, which all of you are active in, is an expression of not reacting and tuning in to nature. So many start to tend and love nature in a reactive way because they feel the weather is becoming more extreme. It's harder to breathe. It's almost like making decisions out of fear, which you know are going to be wrong. And to tune into nature, to live in a synergistic way, to live in a meaningful way, all in reference to nature. The nature has given us everything. We can give back something to her. So our Prithvi Seva Sangha is an expression of Dhamma and Shama, and it's an opportunity. If you think of your relationship with serving our Universal Mother, has this made you a better person? By show of hands, you feel like you're a more disciplined, sensitive personality. We all are. This year, we started off our workshops with changing for nature. And I had explained how a habit is formed. It starts off with actions. These are sourced from words, which are sourced from thoughts, which are sourced from desires, which are sourced from prints. The blueprint to our personality, our vasanas. All of this is a mechanism to form a habit, to form habit. And I had encouraged everyone to develop the habit of rejuvenate. But how do you get to rejuvenate? You have to go through refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle. If you do all of these, you will rejuvenate our environment. You will turn back the hand of time to a nature was not a victim. Rejuvenate. When it comes to offering this to our Universal Mother, this is N-O, which means not optional. So often we see N-A. I recently renewed my Nexus card, my passport, and there's some questions that are not applicable to me. One of the questions is, when did you get naturalized into Canada? I never did. I was born here. So it's N-A. In terms of rejuvenating our environment, this is not optional. Now, drifting into where we are going next, our workshop this evening is on 
transforming transportation. Transforming transportation. Is that good alliteration for everyone? Yes, workable. <laughs> we have a habit to use transportation that is convenient. The critical factor is convenience in terms of time and money. But convenience is not necessarily conserving our environment. So research scientists, uh, this workshop is going to challenge us in terms of our transportation, but habits, they die hard. We need a lot to be able to change. And so as our team and our seekers share on this subject, please remember Vairagya and Abhyasa. Vairagya is prioritizing. And then relatingly, if you prioritize and you have to say no, Abhyasa is practicing, doing that which is beneficial, saying yes to this. Team, please continue. Aditya is with us today. Um, he is a seeker in our community. He's also part of um, the Prithvi Seva Sangha team. Uh, he, from what I know about him so far, um, Aditya is someone who um, expresses his love for Prithvi through very thoughtful and meaningful lifestyle decisions around reducing his carbon footprint. Um, he has worked and continues to seek work around sustainability, both personally and professionally. And I'm looking forward uh, to learning from Aditya and how we can um, also demonstrate our love for Prithvi. Haryom Aditya. Haryom, thank you, Rita, for the introduction. Haryom to Vic G and everyone else. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay. Cool. I'm going to share my screen. And again, can you all see my screen? Okay, great. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you for the introduction. Thank you all for coming today uh, for this uh, workshop. Um, I currently work as a management consultant, primarily on energy transition topics, and I've been interested in sustainability for about four to five years. Uh, I used to work in a refinery in Ontario, and once um, I witnessed an emergency shutdown where millions of cubic feet of natural gas were flared into the atmosphere over a span of just a day and a half, and that didn't sit very well with me. So I started exploring different career paths, and um, uh, like Rita said, I've been on a bit of a sustainability journey over the last few years uh, that involved going to business school, working with the Environmental Def Defense Fund, and now being a consultant focused on energy transition topics. Um, and because I have a job that requires me to travel a lot, I've reflected a lot on how I can cut down on my transportation emissions. Um, and as you'll see over the next few minutes, I. Um, I have a pretty, unlike what Rita said, I have a pretty big carbon footprint, despite not owning a car. Uh, and I'm not an expert, but I'm learning and I'm here to share some of my learnings with you. And uh, many of you have been on this sustainability journey uh, for longer than me, so I'm also here to learn from you. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, uh, before we start, is if you have questions or comments, uh, put them in the chat. I will try to answer them as they come up. Um, if I miss them or if they're too long or too complex, we can address them at the end uh, where we have some time for Q&A. Cool, awesome. So the topic for today is transportation. And that prompts the question, why is it even important to talk about this? And the short answer is it's important to talk about it because it's the second highest source of emissions in the US and also globally. Um, globally, about 25 to 30% of all emissions come from the transportation sector. And then in the US on a per capita basis, if you look at our emissions, the average American and also an average Canadian for my Canadian uh, fellow Canadians um, have a carbon footprint of about 16 to 17 tons um, and per person. And if you look at that, five of those 16 or 17 tons comes from transportation. So it's a pretty significant uh, source of our own emissions. And Globally, if you look at it, um, transportation emissions are actually growing rapidly, uh, just like how when um, 
people and countries get richer, they eat more meat, leading to more agriculture emissions. Similarly, when countries and people around the world get richer, people travel more, and that leads to an increase in transportation emissions. And the good news is that there are technological and behavioral changes that we can all make to try to reduce these emissions. And that's what we're going to focus on today, especially because at least I believe that we have more control over our transportation emissions than some of the other sectors here, like uh, heating or manufacturing. But before we get into specific actions we can take to transform our transportation, uh, I think we need to first understand the breakdown of these transportation emissions. So if you look at the chart on the left here, uh, you'll see that about 53% of our transportation emissions come from road transport. And this is mainly you know, cars, uh, motorbikes, taxis, sometimes buses. Um, so this is the majority of our transportation emissions. It's these small car trips that we make. Uh, and then another about 10 to 11% comes from aviation. So between these two, uh, you know, beige or, or teal green buckets, uh, slices on the pie chart, two thirds of our transportation emissions comes from moving us uh, people from one place to another. Um, and the remaining one third, which is the two blue slices here, the freight transportation, as well as the ocean shipping, comes from moving things to us. So that, that's essentially when you um, buy something on Amazon uh, that's made in China, it is shipped in a ship on a container ship to the US, and then it's moved from the nearby port uh, to your home in various trucks and last mile delivery vehicles. So that's where the blue um, slices come from. And in this presentation, I'll mostly be focusing on the two thirds that come from moving us from one place to another. So how do we actually transform our transportation? Um, I've tried to break it down into two broad categories. Um, category A is uh, the most high impact actions that we should all aim to implement in the next three to five years. And category B is easy actions that we can start making today. Um, within category A, there are three things that I've listed. Um, one is driving electric vehicles. Two is flying less. And three is uh, living in a more optimal area. And the reason I've said these are long-term actions is because ideally we do all three of these today, but it may not be feasible for most of us given how our lives are set up. Um, at the very least, I think we should try to aim to do these in the next three to five years so that we can meet our 2030 and 2050 climate targets. The second category is a little bit more easy actions we can all start taking today, and I'll speak about this a little bit later in the presentation. So um, I anticipate this one, the first action, to be the most easy, but yet possibly the most controversial one for some people, and it is to buy electric vehicles. Um, the reason I say it's important is because the average American and Canadian drives around 11,000 miles, or you know, 18,000, 17,000 kilometers. Uh, per year, and that directly leads to around three tons of CO2 coming out of your tailpipe. So if you're like me and you sell your car and you that number comes down to almost zero, not exactly zero because, you know, I occasionally take an Uber or drive when I visit my parents, I drive their car. But if you can't sell your car, right, um, then replacing that gasoline car with a hybrid will or an electric vehicle will bring that tailpipe, those tailpipe emissions down significantly. Um, there are two common arguments people make against buying electric vehicles. Um, one is that making an EV emits more greenhouse gases than making a battery, uh, than making a gasoline car, because EVs have batteries, they have to be mined and refined and all that, which is a valid point. I'll address that in a second. And the second thing that people sometimes say is that the power required to charge an EV often comes from non-renewable sources. But the thing with both of these points is that um, if you look at actual data and studies done by the International Energy Agency, the US Environmental Protection Agency, and so many other research bodies, the higher emissions that come from making the EV are more than made up for, more than offset. So if you look at an average 15 year lifespan of a, an EV, there's actually a 60% reduction in emissions compared to a gasoline powered vehicle. So although an EV starts with a higher carbon footprint, it doesn't last throughout, and it actually comes down significantly even if your electricity mix is not fully renewable. If your electricity mix is renewable, like if you have solar panels on your home, or if you live in a state or a province with a higher portion of renewables, then your emissions will come down even more. 
um, to like 80% or so. So uh, Rita told me this example yesterday, which I'm going to repeat back to you, which is, it's kind of like what Krishna says in chapter 12 of the Gita, where he says, you know, if you uh, can't keep your mind and intellect on me 24-7, uh, then practice meditation. If you can't do that, then try selfless service. And if you can't do that, just take refuge in my name. It's kind of similar here. If you can't get rid of your car altogether, then try to buy a small electric car. If you can't buy an electric car, then buy a hybrid. And if you can't buy a hybrid, then buy, try to buy a small, low emissions gasoline car like a Civic or a Corolla. But if you do buy a, an electric car, depending on which electric car you buy and the type of electricity you have access to, your overall carbon footprint will go down from around 16 tons for the average American to around 14-ish tons uh, of CO2. And I think that's pretty significant, um, two out of 16, just from this one action of buying an electric car. Now, so far, you know, I've said things that make me look good. The next slide is going to make me look not so good because I'm going to talk about aviation. So um, despite various innovations with uh, more efficient aircraft, more sustainable aviation fuels, um, carbon offsets, uh, smaller electric planes for short duration trips, uh, all of these innovations are just a drop in the bucket and there aren't any real breakthroughs for commercial flying. So whatever emissions I have saved by not owning a car, I more than make up for it in air travel. And I've listed my emissions from 2023 in this table here. Um, and what you can see is that most, in my case, I, a lot of them come from work because my job required me to travel frequently. Um, management consultants pre-COVID would be traveling, you know, 30, 40 weeks a year. And now it's still a lot. 13 weeks uh, was a lot. And that contributed around 2.85 tons of GHG. Um, last year. What I found most interesting was that I took a trip to India to see my grandmother last year. And that one single trip from Chicago to Chennai um, emitted almost as many tons of CO2 as all 13 of my trips combined, right? Um, and so the big takeaway for me from doing this exercise was that um, travel across continents um, is especially potent and especially damaging. And then as you can see, the last two rows here are like from visiting my parents, going on a yatra with the Vekji, going to a friend's wedding, going to go meet friends, et cetera. And yes, some of those could be reduced, but uh, I'm still working on reducing my aviation emissions. But I think overall, what my takeaway here for you all is that your aviation emissions are probably not as bad as mine. But if you made a trip to India, and if you made some trips to the North America for work or for a vacation or to see family, you probably emitted three or four tons of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, greenhouse gases. Maybe that's not as bad as 7.75 as mine, but it's still something for you all to think about and watch out for. Uh, especially people in our demographic, we have a tendency to um, travel a lot, um, especially if we don't have family and friends near us. So what are some potential solutions? Um, the short answer is the easiest one is to travel less. Um, so avoid travel whenever possible, virtual meetings, like our virtual Prithvi Seva Sangha. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest one, most impactful thing we can do. Um, everything else listed here on the right is less impactful, but still worth considering and keeping in mind, right? Um, flying direct, for example, I researched the emissions of, if you fly from Minneapolis to New York City, if you have, take a direct flight versus if you have a layover in Chicago, even though Chicago is in the way, um, the direct flight has 20% fewer emissions um, because there are some inefficiencies of you know having to land again, take off again, and go climb up the cruising altitude, uh, and so on. What I found interesting is that it's not always necessarily true for very long distance intercontinental flights just because of the amount of fuel you have to carry. Uh, a flight from Chicago to Delhi, for example, has just as many uh, emits as just as many tons of CO2 as if you had a layover in Frankfurt, just because you have to carry hundreds of thousands or uh, of liters or tens of thousands of gallons um, for such a 14 hour long flight. Um, but overall, the message is that if you uh, are traveling within North America and you're traveling, um, try to fly direct uh, nonstop flights since that'll have fewer emissions. Um, the next one is about having. Um, selecting the lower emissions option. So many travel agency booking websites, especially Google Flights, has 
um, gives you what is the uh, average uh, emissions for a certain route. Uh, and so this example here from Chicago to London shows you that the American Airlines one has 6% more emissions than the average. And the British Airways one has 28% more emissions than the average. So if all those being equal, the prices are nearly the same, I would try to pick the American Airlines flight because it has it will lead to less emissions than the British Airways one. Um, a few additional things to consider. Um, if you're flying economy over business class, um, you might be having fewer emissions because business class seats take up more space. Um, also, if you carry less luggage, um, that reduces the amount of work the plane needs to do. But again, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the tens of thousands of liters the plane is burning of fuel. The last thing is, is about offsets. I don't know too much about offsets. This is one of the things that I would love to learn from you all if any of you have expertise in offsets. But I, from what I hear and what I've read, uh, the little that I have read is that there are a lot of companies that claim to be doing offsets for fly, air travel, but they don't really do it properly. So that's something for, that's homework for you all to look into and teach me. Cool, the next, the third option, uh, action here is essentially um, to be a bit more thoughtful when you select where to live. Um, and the reason this is important is that the neighborhood you live in will impact how much you need to drive. Um, many of us may be living in neighborhoods like this image on the right, which is in a suburb far away from work, without much public transport, without any walkable areas, without any commercial or recreational areas. And this essentially will increase the amount you need to drive to do pretty much anything and everything. Um, and so if you remember earlier, I had said that the average American has a carbon footprint of around 16 tons of CO2 per year. That There's actually a pretty big difference between different places in the US. So uh, for the average New Yorker, that's around eight tons. And for the average Texan, it's about 24 tons. Uh, a part of it comes from you know having bigger houses, uh, leading to more AC bills, maybe um, eating more meat, leading to more agriculture emissions. But a big part of that actually comes from transportation as well, because uh, when you're living in a more urban area, you don't have to travel as far and make as many um, short car trips um, or even long car trips to do your everyday activities. If you live in a place with public transport um, or in a place where you can walk around or you can go to see your friends and for places of recreation without traveling so far. That is something that can have an impact on your emissions. Uh, many of you are already settled into suburban homes, right? So uh, you can't just uproot your lives and move to uh, a different place just because Aditya told you to do so. Um, but if you are in a life circumstance um, that where you're going to be moving to a new city like Cleveland, um, or you're just you know in a stage of life where your kids are moving out for college and you plan to downsize, uh, it's something to think about. Like um, just think about proximity to work, proximity to public transport, since these things will have a big impact on your emissions overall. So so far we have talked about uh, oh there's a question family of four going from New York to Chicago 12 hour drive is it environmentally friendly to drive or fly. Actually, I think if you are in a single car, right, four people split over a car, uh, the calculations I saw was that it is actually better to drive. But if it's one person, um, then it, I think it's about a toss up between flying and driving. Uh, but I think just Google it because I, I, I saw these studies that tried to do this comparison for Dallas to New York. I don't know exactly what that ratio would, of emissions will be for Chicago to New York. But what I saw was that if you were flying from Dallas to New York for a single person, uh, the driving emissions are lower. But if it's a family, then the car's emissions are sp split across four people. So on a per person basis, it's a little bit better. And yes, there are uh, electric car rentals as well. That's true. Cool. Um, so we've talked about three high impact actions. Maybe we can't do all of them today, but uh, these are things to think about in the short to medium term in the next three to five years. But what can we do today? Uh, I have six suggestions. Um, number one, don't idle. Two is buy local. Three is conduct virtual meetings. Four is to ride a bicycle or walk. 
five is to carpool and make more efficient trips, and six is to advocate. So let's talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. Cool. Um, the first one is to not idle your cars. Uh, according to the U.S. Department of Energy, um, idling wastes a lot of billions of gallons uh, of fuel. It generates many millions of tons of CO2. Um, and so that's something that it's an easy thing to stop doing. Uh, if you, It's better to restart your car, um, uh, essentially turn it off and restart if you're going to idle for more than 10 seconds, since uh, modern batteries and spark plugs are capable of that. There are a lot of misconceptions, uh, especially in cold weather, if you're going to start your cars in winter. Uh, I've heard people say that you need to let your engine run for five or 10 minutes before you start driving. I don't believe this is true, um, uh, especially not for modern cars. Um, most modern vehicles can reach operate, their engines can reach operating temperatures in 30 or so seconds. It's more of you feeling cold and you you don't want to move so much. Uh, and that, and that's the bigger driver. Uh, the engine itself is capable of driving just fine. Uh, you know, there when you're in a, examples of places where you can stop um, idling, if you're on a drive through and the lineup is long, uh, just park your car and go inside. That could be easier. Uh, schools, many parents will idle their cars outside their schools waiting to pick up their kids. This is especially damaging to health health of kids because, you know, they're shorter, they're closer to the tailpipe than you and I are. And so you don't want them to be breathing in things that come out of the tailpipe. Uh, so if it's if the weather is not excruciatingly hot or cold, I suggest I suggest just turning off the car and waiting. Um, part at Starbucks and get their mugs. Enjoy your coffee inside. You mean park? Uh, yes. Cool. Uh, the second piece is to buy local goods. Uh, if you'll remember this pie chart I showed you earlier, I had shown you how two thirds of our transportation emissions come from moving us human beings from place to place, and one third comes from moving things to us. So if you buy locally produced food and locally produced goods, then you're reducing the distance that products will need to travel um, from where they're made to where to where you are. Uh, so essentially. For example, if you're trying to buy, uh, I don't know, bananas or trying to buy, yeah, I think it's called food, food miles, yes, that's, that sounds familiar to me. Uh, if you're trying to buy whatever, a water bottle, if you buy something that's made in the US at least, then you're reducing the ocean shipping emissions. If you're buying food that's grown nearby to you, you're reducing the amount of trucking emissions and so on. Uh, and you're not only doing that, you're also strengthening the local economy and you're in addition to reducing the overall emissions from moving the your products and services to you from wherever they're made. Uh, question, is there a good emission statistic to remember in terms of ordering from Amazon versus buying from a local food store? Uh, I, I think I've been asked this question before and the short answer is I don't know. Um, the, there's arguments that people make that the Amazon driver uh, who is delivering the item to you is going to be having fewer emissions, one, because Amazon is shifting to electric Rivian vehicles, and two, because they are making more efficient trips. Um, the counter argument, though, is that every little thing you buy on Amazon comes inside a box, which comes inside another box, which comes inside a third box, which has a bunch of tape and stickers on it. Um, so I think that creates more waste. Uh, so I don't know is my short answer on the overall trade-off between the two things I said. Maybe uh, a second piece of homework for you all in addition to offsets. Uh, you're going to miss mangoes and a lot of Indian vegetables then. Yes, although you could um, import them from Texas. My parents grow a lot of Indian vegetables in their garden in Texas. So I if you want, I can connect you to them and they can create a shipping business uh, to you. And yes, even better to grow your own vegetables and fruits pesticide free. Yes, my parents do that a lot and it's very tasty. Cool. Then moving on to other easy things we can do. Uh, this one I think is pretty obvious. Uh, it's to opt for more virtual meetings wherever possible. I realize many employers are now 
mandating you all return to the office. Um, but wherever possible, I think uh, traveling less or doing virtual meetings will enable you to travel less and uh, thereby reduce your uh, transportation related emissions. The same thing for the next one, uh, also pretty self uh, self explanatory. Um, walking and riding bicycles for short trips, especially when the weather permits um, can reduce the overall uh, emissions, uh, your transportation emissions, and it's a great form of exercise as well, uh, which is pretty much what I do uh, whenever I need to go anywhere. And the, but I, it's easy for me to say because I live in, in a city with uh, good public transport. Um, but that's an idea for those who are able to do it. Uh, this one is kind of interesting to carpool and make more efficient trips. Um, I know many people live in suburbs far away from each other. Um, so you may not be able to carpool with each other, but um, with a little planning, you can carpool with your family members, uh, especially when you're going to work or when you're going to school or to Balavihar. I, I've seen uh, myself uh, families where, you know, there are two parents, two kids, and they're trying to go from home to Balavihar on a Sunday morning. And they would take choose to take two or three cars uh, for that uh, excursion, just because they want to have a little bit more flexibility on when they leave and when they go back home. Um, I would suggest the opposite end of, the, of that spectrum, where a family will have one car and they will plan and prioritize and consolidate trips so that they can be a little bit more efficient. It does require uh, a change. It does require a little bit of inconvenience to be able to do that. But that I think is more beneficial in the long term. Um, and in, in addition to that, also running errands and stuff like that. If you if you just plan your day in advance, you may be able to combine multiple errands into a single trip and be a little bit more efficient in terms of how you drive. And the last action I have for you all is to advocate um, and be part of various uh, planning processes in your community, within your local government. Um, to help with addressing public transport, walkability, and overall just encourage more uh, Prithvi-loving modes of transportation. So let's maybe pause here and I can, let's spend five-ish minutes trying to answer some questions and then we will spend another 10 to 12 minutes in breakout rooms uh, before we close. So why don't we, uh, spend a few minutes now to answer any questions that you all have. Yes, Ravinji. Um, thank you for the awesome presentation, Aditya. Um, one question about the um, uh, buying hybrid versus, um, you know, uh, electric and, and electric. You mentioned buying electric will reduce your carbon footprint from 16 to 14 tons. Is that right? Approximately, depending on the size of electric vehicle, the type of battery you have, as well as the energy mix that you have feeding the electric vehicle. So it's right. an average estimate by the International Energy Agency. Uh, that, that doesn't look like a 60% uh, or 40%. Uh, it's a 40% decrease in transportation specific emissions. So transportation, if you remember, was about five uh, tons. So the two tons, uh, two to three tons is essentially uh, 40 to 60 percent, depending on whether it's an hybrid or an electric vehicle and the mix of energy that you have. Cool. Uh, Hamsa. Uh, Harion, thank you, Aditya. This is a really uh, helpful presentation, and I apologize for having my camera off today. But um, I had one quick statement and one question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, Regarding the food miles concept, I was actually part of a team a few years ago that did a research project on this concept for public radio and public television in Boston. And we were tasked with studying whether buying locally was actually going to reduce people's emissions. And what we found is that buying locally is not is not the most effective way to reduce the emissions impact of your food. And the reason for that is because when, if you live in Cleveland, for example, and you buy a tomato or a strawberry that's produced in California, it's coming from really far away. And there is probably a farm in your local area that is going to grow tomatoes or strawberries. But because the 
agriculture system in California is so huge. It has what's called economies of scale. So the impact going into each tomato and each strawberry, even after it's transported on a truck or on a plane to Cleveland, Ohio, is still going to be less than the average impact that's going into a single tomato or strawberry in Ohio. So uh, that's not to say that uh, buying locally doesn't have other benefits, but by supporting a local farmer, you're more likely to have people who will support your local economy. A local farmer is more likely to bring food to your kid's school or to come and teach them about farming and about food. So there's other local benefits that come from buying um, your food locally, but um, it's not necessarily an emissions thing. So just a little bit of perspective on that point, just because I've been in that research project. The question I had for you was regarding the equity impacts of some of the things that you had mentioned. So if we want to buy an electric car, um, a lot of the precious metals that go into making batteries are extracted from indigenous communities and other developing countries. And I'm wondering if in your work you've put into any, any consideration into those issues and what you kind of talk about in those terms as a management consultant. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, point taken regarding uh, local versus uh, lo buying local food or not. Uh, clearly you've done more research on this topic and are more knowledgeable. So uh, I think that makes sense. It is true that economies of scale will help you reduce your emissions. Um, I, but I think the point is also, uh, my point was mainly specific to the transportation specific emissions uh, that will be reduced if you're not necessarily shipping it. But I think the overall emissions from that product may still be different and may still be better coming from a far away place. So point taken there. Um, regarding the uh, question on battery being mined uh, in Places, yes, that is a significant concern. Uh, it depends on the chemistry of the battery. NMC batteries require cobalt, uh, which comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, which is often mined using uh, challenging child labor practices. Um, nickel, which is part of the NMC battery, comes from Indonesia, which often requires biodiversity loss in some cases. Um, there is There are other chemistries that do not require this, like LFP batteries, which is basically based on uh, lithium and iron. But again, that is there is some concern about lithium also being extracted from such communities. And so I think it's a mix. Uh, the short answer of how to address it is going to be a mix of regulation, as well as uh, more uh, advocacy on the part of consumers. So I think that's that's my answer. But again, there is the flip side of the argument is that oil and gas that is being used to build your gasoline or power your gasoline car doesn't necessarily always come from countries with the best human rights records, especially if, they're coming, if the oil is coming from the Middle East. Um, so that's also, it's not, the, the problem does not only affect electric vehicles, but it is true that for cobalt, especially, uh, there are such concerns that need to be addressed question in the chat about getting rid of an old car when it works just fine and getting an EV, what's better for the earth? Uh, I don't have a clear answer, but I'll tell you my thought process. Uh, so for, in terms of just purely emissions, um, the first few years of buying an EV will have higher emissions than, uh, than the car, the gasoline car, just because the year you buy your EV or the year it was made is when um, all the batteries were mined or and refined and put into the EV. So there's greater emissions uh, initially from the EV, but that will reduce over time. Um, versus the gasoline car was going to continue uh, emitting and burning gasoline um, every time you drive it, uh, leading to emissions. So I personally would probably keep the gasoline car until it's uh, no good and then sell it. Uh, Oh, and then or trash it depending on how old it is. But I think the more emissions specific thing to do might be to switch to the EV. Something to think about more, but I think that's my hypothesis or guess. The really nice presentation. Really, really appreciate everything that you shared. I, I, along those same lines, does it make a difference? So if it's already a gasoline car, if it's an older car, a newer car, does that... Generally, make... newer cars are 
more efficient and more uh sorry may i finish your question no no that i mean just kind of along those lines like we we have one electric car and um trying to figure out with our boys do we give them the older cars or do we buy you know like i mean right now they're sharing one car and we have one electric and one um gasoline car right so now we're trying to figure out do we get rid of one of the cars and get an electric car or is that actually doing more harm to have a functioning working car and get rid of it right are you actually doing more harm so to the environment I, I would say whichever one of you is going to drive less give them the gasoline car because for gasoline cars the emissions are going to come when the gasoline is put into the engine and it explodes leading to co2 right uh so the less you do that the fewer your emissions are going to be uh so whoever is driving less give them the gasoline car is my answer uh yeah, that's helpful <laughs> that's helpful thank you whereas as for the ev the emissions have already happened uh for the most part by the time it's been made and uh the emissions are fewer when you drive compared to gasoline cars Aditi, I have a question then. So you said if you're um, powering your EV with mixed energy, so if somebody is like has solar panels, mm -hmm. um, is that still the case then? Or is there then a better sort of or a less footprint then? Then if you have... Uh, then you said something you about mixed. You said something Yeah, yeah. So mixed. essentially what I'm saying is that if you, in pretty much every state in the U.S., uh, the energy mix, uh, whatever it is to power the electric vehicle, it's still better than burning gasoline inside an ICE vehicle, ICE meaning an internal combustion engine vehicle. Uh, so... If you live in a state with more renewables as a proportion of your electricity supply, then that means your emissions are even lower. That's what I'm saying. So even if you live in Texas uh, or Louisiana, states with, uh, actually Texas has lots of renewables. Uh, they have tons of wind and solar. But if you live in a state like Louisiana, for example, uh, without too much renewables in the electricity grid, uh, even there, uh, it's still better uh, from an emissions perspective uh, to drive an electric vehicle over the long-term duration uh, of the life of the car. Cool. Any other questions? If not, we can wrap up. Oh, I see a question in the chat. Uh, actually, that is true. I'm, uh, the best answer is to get rid of all your cars. Um, that is the one way to get your emissions to zero. Um, but if you're not able to do that, then follow the nested loop statement that Lord Krishna gives um, that I've tried to use as an analogy. Uh, how do we encourage people to pursue careers focused on environmental sustainability? Could you share some more environment-based careers that parents, families expose their young ones to? I think there is environmental uh, topics to get involved in every industry um, from uh, you know, if you're working for a regular consumer goods company, how do you make your packaging more sustainable, right? Um, if you are working for an energy company, how do you, or utility grid, how do you make a greater share of your energy come from renewable sources? So there, pretty much every uh, industry can be made more sustainable, but there are some industries that are most impacted by the energy transition. And that's going to be the utilities or energy sector and then the transportation sector. Uh, in terms of how to encourage, I think it's just, uh, that, that may be a question for AG or others who have uh, more insight into how to encourage people. Cool, we're at 8.44. Uh, why don't we flip into our discussion and let's spend maybe 10, 12 minutes in discussion and we can come back and have four or five minutes for a wrap up. So. Our discussion subject for today, uh, I would like each of you to set up one high impact goal that you plan to take up over the next three to five years and one easy action 
that you will start implementing tomorrow. Ideally today, but it's already 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so starting tomorrow. I've given an example of each of these goals um, that, that are my specific goals. And I want you to spend 10 minutes uh, or so tailoring these goals to be more specific and more relevant to you. And then obviously sharing it uh, amongst yourself in the breakout groups. Uh, I've put a link in the chat and essentially it's a link to this specific slide so that you can still have access to the slide when you are in the breakout room. Mario, before, thank you all for the discussion. Before I pass it back to uh, Rita, I just wanted to add one more thing in answer to the prior question, um, especially about minerals for batteries coming from challenging places. Um, as we get closer to the end of the decade, that we will reach a critical mass of min minerals that have been mined and battery recycling is already starting to become more commercially feasible. And as we get closer to the end of the decade, used batteries will start being recycled more and more. So the dependence on those mines will decrease um, as battery recycling takes off. And that is something that many startups have already started looking into, but um, that is something that needs to happen more. But that's a third dimension in addition to uh, chemistry as well as government policy. I just wanted to add that. Um, but let's pass it back to Rita and. Uh, to close out. Thank you, Aditya. That was um, wonderful. Uh, we were talking in our discussion group about, you know, just hearing your story and, you know, making these things, um, understanding that there are challenges, especially with um, travel and having um, family, you know, overseas and, you know, those challenges, those are real. And so, what other things can we do and just be more mindful. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just looking at our uh, spreadsheet of things that um, goals that people have chosen uh, for long term, I see uh, rethinking where to live. Um, the electric cars seem to be the pop, uh, popular electric or hybrid uh, in terms of the long term and then uh, not idling cars for the things we can start tomorrow. And um, it looks like reducing number of trips and, you know, uh, running the errands more efficiently. So thank you everyone for all of that. Um, this has been a wonderful workshop. And our uh, workshops are every, uh, the first Sunday of every month. So uh, we'll see everyone next month. And please also join us on WhatsApp. We'll continue the conversation there. And uh, this, the aim for this month now is to um, follow through on these goals that we've decided and the personal goals, the two personal goals, and then our societal goal is to share what we're doing with others. And I think probably going forward, we'll continue with that because that's really uh, how we will spread the word. So thank you, everyone. And we'll end with three Shantis. And anyone who would like to stay on, please do so. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Hari Om.